Hi, my name is Audra Maduri, and I attend Trinity on the West Side with my children and my husband, and I miss this building. I miss worshiping with you guys. I just want you to know that I am so excited because today you're gonna hear from an incredible woman with an amazing testimony. Her name is Latanya, and she has a story that is gonna be life-changing and encouraging for you guys. She's doing great things in Atlanta, and I can't wait for our Trinity family to hear about it. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship. Father God, we thank you that we live in this rich, diverse city. Please use us, Lord, to make this city a better place, one that would honor you, Lord, and seek your will in all ways. Lord, we love you and praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything and your goodness is running after it's running after me
all my life you have been faithful. Thank you, Lord. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
We'll continue worship with a reading. This is Psalm 114. Hallelujah. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange speech, Judah became God's sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea behind it beheld it and fled. Jordan turned and went back. The mountains skipped like rams and the little hills like young sheep. What ails you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back. You mountains that you skipped like rams, you little hills like young sheep. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the hard rock into a pool of water and flintstone into a flowing spring. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And if you don't build it, we labor in vain. And without your spirit, we stand with no strength. And I know my time is passing away. But the works of your hand are what will remain. Let the favor of the Lord rest upon us. Oh Lord, establish the world. Just to run, to finish the race. For only what's done in love will remain. Let the favor of the Lord rest upon.
Hey y'all, I'm Brad Malden, the community pastor at Trinity. Last week you heard us invite you to live into this opportunity to love our neighbor with intention and purpose. Today, I wanna to highlight two things. First is a reminder to put together those hygiene kits. We wanna make 750 of those kits to be able to give away in partnership with Lazarus. Bring those to the church 4 to 6 p.m. during the Sundays in September. The second thing is an incredible opportunity we have to be able to hear more from our partner, Paul Kids. I'm actually standing here in Grove Park at Paw Kids, and we have an opportunity to hear from the amazing founder of Paw Kids, LaTanya Gates. We're at less than five minute, miles from the church here. Yes. Grove Park is, is part of Atlanta, it's part of the west side, um, but so many people in our community have no idea um, about Grove Park, have no idea about the work that Paw Kids is doing in Grove Park and the reasons for it. So just let's start. Tell us a little bit about uh, maybe you, what you do, and then what Paw Kids does. Um, a little bit about myself. So I am um, an ambitious African-American woman. I feel like I have been privileged and God has blessed me with opportunities that I, wa I wanted to share and give back. Um, to a community that lacked resources, right? And so I had this big dream and I took it to my church, which is Atlanta West Side, and I told Walter, like, I really wanna help start an enrichment program. And the church really got behind me and we moved and we brought one of the largest drug houses on Bankhead. And so for people that don't know, the P in Paul stands for Paradise Baptist Church, which is one of the oldest um, African-American churches that sits here in Grove Park. And then the AW stands for Atlanta West Side Presbyterian Church, right? So it's a Baptist church, Presbyterian church, coming together to leave an imprint in Grove Park, which is the Paw. In 2014, on the west side of Atlanta, our community lacked resources. No grocery store, no pharmacy, um, just the basic things that we needed here. I know the people watching this can't really necessarily see that we're sitting in a building right now and there's actually two other buildings then those three buildings kind of serve maybe different purposes yes. can you tell us a little bit about those purposes so and maybe I, start with the buildings themselves yes so our our heart's desire is to first the child the family and community so if you skip let's go with the child and we have the paw kids house which is a year-round enrichment program um, for about 35 kids here in Grove Park um, we focus on reading behavioral health um, summer camp um, STEM program, so that program runs throughout the year. So the gathering place is mostly where we host Bible studies, um, our behavioral health groups, cooking classes for parents. If you need to come in and wash your clothes, take a shower, that's the gathering place. And then let's skip over to Claudia's house. Um, Claudia's house came out of COVID. We did not expect for this. And so we actually took a building that was vacant for 20 years. Now we're actually serving over 2,000 meals a week. Meals, right? Um, went through Mercedes-Benz, Atlanta Braves, um, Good Samaritan, Food Security Across America, um, Love It. Everybody, different organizations, different churches are chipping in to help us um, serve the community, to help us, to allow us to help us help others. You and I met uh, because we went to Kenya together. Um, one of the things you talked about is that that trip, being in Kenya and watching uh, the ministry and the organization that we worked with was super informative uh, for you and it shaped you in terms of how you kind of were maybe made ready for this time. Uh, tell, say a little bit more about that. Um, Kenya made me look at life different. You're not coming to, to save the poor, right? But you're actually coming to live life. And the biggest thing I learned is it's the community that does it. You guys have given them a chance to actually build their own community. So I felt I felt like, hey, why not give the people a chance of Grove Park? Allow them to build their community. They know what they need versus anybody else. So I've connected with over seven churches that, that's right here in this community. And look, catch this. They've been here over 20 years. Small storefront churches that actually lack resources. We're now a hub for those churches and we're building our community right here in Grove Park. I feel like we can't make it without each other. Um, I, when I was a child, my grandmother would send me down, three houses down and say, hey, go ask them if they have a, a carton of milk. Ask them if can we borrow some eggs. We're right back there. Now, what are ways that, that would be helpful for us as a community at Trinity to be able to invest and support the work that you're doing here in Paul Kids and especially in Grove Park? Um, ways to get involved, first of all, is prayer. Pray for the seniors. 
that God continues to cover them. A lot of the seniors here, the conditions of their homes are not safe. We have over 4,000 evictions. So we're, we're, our mercy fund is another thing. And then operation costs, I want to keep my community working here in their community. So those are some things, yes. Well, thank you for your time and for the way that you lead. Uh, not only do you love your neighbor and you're doing it in remarkable ways, but you bring glory to God through it, uh, which is just a gift and a challenge to everybody who watches you in the life that you're living right now. So God bless you. Please. But thank you, but thank you for walking this walk with me. Thank you for the night. So you guys don't know that I cry and I can't make it. You call with a prayer or scripture, you sit down with me over tea or over coffee. I appreciate that. Thank you for being a true friend. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trinity. My name is Matthew, and I'm sure I'm unfamiliar to many of you, and that's because I spend most of my time on the east side of our city as the parish pastor of Trinity Eastside. But it's really good to be with you today and to open up God's word with you. You've been hearing us say now for weeks that our mission at Trinity during this season has not changed, but what has changed is how we're living into that mission, uh, specifically uh, with how we're doing Sunday worship. We're inviting you to find some people in a neighborhood group or people who live near you who you can spend some time on Sunday worshiping together and listening to the teaching and also taking communion, which means you need to come here to the West Side to receive your communion kit so that the following Sunday you're able to, to take it with one another. So we want to invite you today between four and six to come and pick up your kits, but not simply to pick up a communion kit. We actually want you to come and hang out. Um, on the east side, we've been doing this for more than a month, and the best part of it has actually been just hanging out with people, familiar faces you haven't seen in a long time, praying with people. So the pastors of the west side are going to be here, and we invite you to come to church and to experience a little bit of that community, that time that we used to have with one another, as well as pick up your kit so that next week you're ready to go. That'll be today from four to six, and we hope to see you there. I'm going to read to us from Matthew 18, and then after reading, I'll pray, and we will um, we'll jump in together. Beginning in verse 21, And then Peter came, and he said, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves, and when he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all their possessions and payments to be made. And so the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, he came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. And then the fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. And then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. And when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. And then the Lord summoned him and said, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. And so my heavenly Father will do also to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. It's a hard word. And we thank you, God, that we can trust that if you're calling us to it, that there's something about it that actually is a grace. That there's a, that there's a gift for us in this teaching. And so, Spirit, we, um, we just want to be present to you and let our guard down and let you speak. Help us to hear you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this passage, it begins with a with a like a, like it's like a bridge between last week's teaching that Ashley did and then the, the story that follows. Uh, Peter goes to Jesus after Jesus has been talking about forgiveness for a while, and he essentially says, like, 
can you flesh out the parameters of this thing? How does this work exactly? Seven times, is that enough? And Jesus says, no, not, not seven, 77, which is not meant to be a precise number. It's actually Jesus referencing the year of Jubilee. Codified in the Mosaic law was this idea that after seven cycles of seven years, all debts were forgiven. All slaves were released. All lands were returned to the original owners. And so Jesus essentially is saying to Peter, a Christian is somebody who lives in a perpetual jubilee year, always releasing, always forgiving, always giving away. And then he says, for this reason, and he tells a story, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who begins to collect debts. And there's one slave in particular who has a tremendous debt, 10,000 talents, which is a number that means nothing to you and me probably. But a talent was 20 years of salary, 20 years of wages. And so this man has a 200,000 years worth of wages debt. Scholars have done the math and we're looking at a number in the realm of $10 billion uh, in, in today's money. It's like a comedic thing. Like Jesus almost says something so ridiculous, no one could imagine. How, would he, how do you get a $10 billion debt? I mean, did he, um, did he blow up the king's palace? Did he, did he gamble away the king's NFL franchise? How do you possibly accrue that much debt for yourself? And yet, amazingly, the king forgives it. He doesn't just say, okay, you have some more time. He says, I forgive it. Go in peace. Now, we are probably looking at each other at this point and saying, ah, this is a feel-good story. This is one of those times where uh, we see that God's mercy is extravagant, that there's no limit or end to it, that God continues to give, and he never says, uh, he's never says that that's been enough. And so we say, oh, this is meant to remind us that God's mercy is, is deep and limitless and, and boundaryless, which, which of course it is. And yet the story takes a strange turn because what happens next is this same slave goes out and the first thing he does is shakes down a guy who owes him far, far less. A hundred denarii is not nothing, but uh, it's about four months wages. But it's still, the comparison between the two figures is, in, is meant to be extreme and ridiculous. And so this man, he shakes this person down, he says, give me what I want. And yet this man who owes a relatively far smaller debt says, please, once again, have mercy on me. And the man says, no, puts him in debtor's prison and says, you're going to have to pay this whole thing off before you get out. And the last movement of our story is the king finds out about this. He is very angry that his extravagant mercy has not produced mercy in this other slave. And so he takes him and puts him away in prison. And here's the thing, to be tortured until he has paid off 200,000 years of wages. And Jesus gives the coda, and so my Father in heaven will do to every one of you who does not forgive your brother or sister from their heart. Are we awake? Are we listening to this? Are we, are we aware of the, <laughs> the power and the force and the gravity of what Jesus is saying in these words? Are you tempted like I am in, in a moment like this to try to minimize the force of these words? To say, oh, surely he can't, be, he can't be speaking literally. This must be hyperbolic. This must be Jesus saying something else entirely. Whenever we run up against a hard teaching of Jesus, I think it's always wise to, to ask the question that our bishop, uh, I, I first heard Bishop Todd Hunter ask this years ago, which is simply this. When I come across a hard teaching of Jesus, I simply ask, do I think Jesus is smart? Is he intelligent? Does he know what reality is in a way that I don't? Can I trust that he's describing, not just like some exaggerated emotional thing, but he's actually describing the mystery of what actually is? Do I believe Jesus is an intelligent person? Because if I do, well, then I, then I will lean in. I'll say, okay, what do you have to say in this teaching to me? We're going to have four ideas that come out of this text, and I'll just go through them very quickly. The first is this. Uh, God gives mercy without limit. God gives mercy to us without limit, and that's, that's a wonderful teaching. It means that it, it's not like if the, if the slave had owed the, the king $12 billion, the king would have said, I'm sorry, I can't do a dollar over $10 billion. I'm sorry, you've just reached your limit. That's, that's your capacity. That's not how it works. Jesus gives the most ridiculous, elaborate figure because he wants you and me to know that you will never hit the bottom of what God is willing and eager to give to you and me. That's the context. That's the background of this whole story. God's limitless, boundaryless willingness to forgive everything, 
everyone, no matter how egregious, how great. That's what God offers to you and me. The shocking thing for Jesus in this story, the, th the thing in his mind that, he, that, that shocks him, is not the, the generosity of the king, but it's what, it's what the servant does with the generosity. And so, we see from the beginning, the first principle is that there is no limit to the mercy that God offers to us. The second thing we see, the big idea, is that in the kingdom of God, forgiveness is meant to produce more forgiveness. It's not that God forgives us so that we will forgive, and that's the only reason. God forgives us because he wants to forgive us. I mean, we used to say every week when we would gather in person, God wants to give you his peace. He wants to extend peace to you. Um, and yet, one of the reasons that God forgives us is because it will transform us and make us into uh, forgivers. The assumption is that a Christian is going to understand that they are no more deserving of mercy than even the worst among us. And that will produce in us forgiveness. The third idea that we see in this is that there is a difference between forgiveness and excusing. C.S. Lewis first wrote about that years ago in an, in an essay on forgiveness, this idea between forgiveness and excusing. What most of us want and look for, hope for from God, is that he's going to just sort of understand what's going on. You know, he's just going to be able to go, well, you know, character weaknesses. Oh, well, you know, uh, personality quirks. And he's just going to understand that we're frail and that we're weak and excuse it, which is a totally different thing from forgiveness. And the thing is, is I actually, I want to just be excused. I, I don't want to be forgiven. If I have to be forgiven, it, it raises and maximizes a, the magnitude of my badness. Badness has to be forgiven, but weakness can just be excused. And we tend to actually provide that sort of, hey, you're not that bad either to one another. We're okay with it. We're good with saying, I know that I'm not that bad. I'm trying really hard, but I still make mistakes. I know the same is true for you until, until something happens that we can't just do that with. Until one of our family members abuses us. Until a trusted friend gossips about us behind our back and we find out about it until a professional opportunity is taken away from us because we confided in a coworker, and now that's being used against us. Until my best friend starts dating the person that I have a crush on or that I'm in love with. Until these things that feel like they're personal, that they wound us, suddenly it's not just something that I can just excuse anymore. Suddenly it's something that actually has a price tag associated with it. You see, if I'm selfish, um, it's probably because I'm tired. But if you're selfish, um, it's because you're a bad person. You know, if, I, if I'm envious of your lifestyle, it's, it, it's probably just because I'm, uh, you know, money's always been a stressor in my life, or I grew up in a house where we never quite had enough. But if you're envious of my life, it's because it's you're a greedy person who can't just be happy for other people. See, we want excusing to apply to ourselves because it makes our badness little. But when someone else wrongs us, when someone else sins against us, it's a different thing. And the problem for this servant is that he's not dealing in the reality of what has actually happened. He's refusing to deal with what the Bible calls sin. Uh, sin is, is not merely like, oh, well, I had a rough day. It is a real thing. It's, 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 it's an offense. It's, it's a cancer in the body. It's a disease. And it's not enough to just look at it and say, well, you know, we, we can understand. We can't just excuse away something that is actually utterly destroying us. We need to address it. We need to treat it. Why does the church talk about sin so much? It's because Jesus tells us to talk about sin, because it is, it is dealing in the reality of things as they really are. And this servant was unwilling to do that. He's unwilling to see that he himself actually was forgiven an enormous, tremendous, ridiculous, absurd amount of debt, and that he had caused that, and that was hit on him. He actually feels in some way entitled to it. He feels appropriate. He thinks that he should be forgiven. But when he finds a fellow slave, someone who's wronged him in such a small way comparably, he, he takes him all the way to the end. He takes him to court. He thinks that his vengeance in this, in this um, instance is actually appropriate. Um, I just need to say this. This is important. If the thing that is standing between you and me 
and, and fellowship with God, if the only thing standing between us and the life with God that he uh, wants to give us through Christ, if the only thing standing in the way is our weaknesses, our frailty, then the cross of Jesus doesn't make very much sense. But rather, it says in 1 Peter 2 that Jesus Christ bore in his body our sins on the tree. He bore our sins in his body. Why? So that we could die to sin and be made alive uh, to righteousness. It's not merely weakness. It's not merely frailty. It's not personality quirks. It's not character defects. It, it's not any, it's not, that's not enough. It doesn't explain it all the way. Jesus was on a cross because of sin in my life. And until the church is willing to look at it and say it honestly, we will never know how to receive what God has done for us, and we'll never know what to do with one another. We'll never have a ground to stand on, really, to be outraged. We'll never understand what is needed for healing and reconciliation, what actually has to be dealt with. We come to the final idea of this text, which is simply this. You and I are called to be abundantly, endlessly forgiving to one another. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4, be kind, tender-hearted to one another, forgiving even as God uh, in Christ has forgiven you. And how has God forgiven you in Christ? Through suffering. That's how. How did God forgive you and me through Christ? Through suffering, which tells us something about what forgiveness costs. And forgiveness is not an easy thing. It's not a pain-free thing. It is actually something where I choose, I choose to take the suffering into myself rather than to exact it from you. Um, therefore, Forgiveness is never going to feel like something you want to do. You know, sometimes we have something that we're, we're, we've been holding on to for years, and we say, well, I can't, I just don't feel ready to forgive this person. You're never going to feel ready to forgive this person. We tend to make an idol out of our feelings in the realm of forgiveness. It's not about whether or not we feel it. Forgiveness has to be willed first before, um, before we feel it. Tim Keller says uh, it this way in, in an essay on forgiveness. He says, um, in all cases, when wrong is done, there is a debt, and there is no way to deal with it without suffering. Either you make the perpetrator suffer for it, or you forgive and suffer for it yourself. Forgiveness is when I choose to take the payment of what um, I could require from you, and I choose to pay for it myself, and therefore suffering, uh, forgiveness is a road of suffering. It's a road of not getting the pound of flesh that you feel like you owe. But it is a lie to believe that unforgiveness is a way of pain-free living. It's not. In fact, it is not a coincidence, not a surprise, that the man who refuses to forgive the other servant is thrown into a place where he is tortured. Forgiveness is a form of suffering for sure, but unforgiveness is a form of torture, of self-torture. It is a way in which we actually bring tremendous pain on ourselves we have this imagined idea that if I, I can, if I refuse to forgive you, I hold some sort of power over you. I can imprison you in a debtor's prison in my own heart where I, where I demand for you to make up for what you have done. But I'm actually the one behind the bars. I'm actually the one who is imprisoning um, myself. The pain does not go away in forgiveness. It does over time. It can minimize. But I think one of the reasons Jesus says forgive 77 times is not because you're going to forgive a person for 77 different things. It's because you might have to forgive the same person 77 times for the same thing. It's something you have to do again and again and to choose the person again and again. And Jesus says, this is what disciples do. They live in a perpetual year of jubilee. This is what they offer to others. That just as God in Christ forgave us through suffering, so we are willing to take into ourselves that cost so that we can set people free. So I want to give you a couple of reflection questions for you to, to talk about with your, your people or just to reflect on this week. But these are questions that are meant to, to give some sort of a framework to a discussion around this text today. The first question is this, has there been a time in my life where I have made excuses for sin? And how did that hurt others in my life? Has there been a time in my life where I've made excuses for sin? And has that hurt others in my life? And then secondly, am I currently holding someone in a prison for things that they've done to me? 
who I need to decide to release? What would a tangible step in that direction be this week? Is there someone in your life, someone in your story that you have kept in prison because you think it gives you some power that it's actually, it's time to choose to open up the gates. It's time to let the person out. So we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer in a minute. And this is, if you're taking communion with us, this is when I encourage you to go and get your elements so that we can do this uh, after, after we pray. I also just want to remind you that um, if this is your home church, uh, one of the things that we're called to do as Christians is to give to the church. It's a way of supporting the mission. It's a way of being a part of the community. And so if this is your home church, you can give to us by going to our website, westside.atltrinity.org. At the same time, if you are just visiting, if you're just, uh, if you're checking us out online, I'm really glad you're here and everything's taken care of. Please don't give. It's all taken care of. We're just, uh, we're just excited that you want to be a part of this uh, during this season. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. And especially I want us to make note of the line that we pray every week, and so it may feel even tired to you, but forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. You may not be in a place today where that feels true to you. You may not be able to say that is true right now. So rather, as you pray it, speak it as a word of faith over your heart. Speak it as a declaration of faith and belief over your life and say, this will be true that as I have been forgiven, so I will forgive. So would you pray with me as one um, with the confidence of children to our Father? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you. Uh, You are loved. We hope to see you real soon.